the end of time as we know it is rapidly approaching. The great battle of Armageddon is upon us. How will this final chapter all play out in the final days of man on Earth? The answer is documented in the book of Revelation. Verse number nine. We finished verse number 8. We were really moving. Tonight, we're going to go all the way to verse number 15. I promise you that. All right? I've cut some things short in order to do that. I, John, who also am your brother and companion in tribulation, and in the kingdom and patience of Jesus Christ, was in the isle that is called Patmos, for the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. Now, today, the island of Patmos is known as Patino. It is a small, rocky, barren island in the Aegean Sea. It's located about 50 miles from the ancient city of Ephesus and 37 miles from Miletus. Let's go ahead and pop that up. I kind of want to give you an idea of where it's at because you need to understand a little, bit, a little bit about the conditions that John was in when he had this revelation he wrote. This is the Mediterranean Sea. Here's Egypt. Here's Israel. Here is what in the ancient world is known as, as uh, Asia Minor, but we know it as Turkey now, and here is Greece, and here's the island of Crete. Now, let's zoom in a little bit. Can we do that? Good job. Here is Patmos. Here's the ancient city of, uh, of Ephesus, and here's Mile uh, Miletus. And then over here, we have Corinth, and we have Athens. So that kind of gives you an idea. We're going to leave that up there because I'm going to talk a little bit about Patmos. Patmos is about 10 miles long and six miles wide. It was the Alcatraz of the ancient world because it had a penal colony there, but also because you were unable to escape once you were sentenced there. And the reason you were unable to escape is because you could not swim to the neighboring islands. You could not swim to the mainland. Now, it looks like, well, wait a minute, there's some islands here. But what you need to understand is that the currents run from north to south. And if you tried to swim to any of the neighboring islands, which these two are the closest, the currents would carry you out into the Mediterranean Sea, and you would drown. Also, because it was a rocky, barren island, there was no trees there. You couldn't build a raft. So if you were banished to the island, you never left. You basically worked in the mines until the day that you died. And according to Herbert Lockyer, anyone ever read any of his books? Herbert Lockyer writes that the prisoners worked chained to their slave barrels. Now, you don't talk that way today, so let me explain what a slave barrel is. A slave barrel is nothing more than a wheelbarrow. Everyone knows what a wheelbarrow is, right? Well, they were actually chained to those slave barrels. They slept with their slave barrel there. They worked with it. They went to the restroom with it. You never were released from it. So unless a prisoner was pardoned or unless they were granted amnesty, they died in the mine. What a life. But that's why John wrote, I, John, who also am your brother and companion in tribulation. Here he was close to 90 years old. Do you realize that? He was almost 90 years old when he wrote this. In fact, What's kind of interesting is that most scholars believe that the book of Revelation was written in the year 95 A.D. So here he is, 90 years old. He's imprisoned on the island of Patmos, and he's forced to work in the mines with very little hope of ever being released. He's too old. But he used his situation to do what? To encourage others. He says, I'm your companion in tribulation. Now that word tribulation is kind of an interesting word. It's the Greek word thalipsis. Originally, it was used to describe a certain type of torture. In the ancient world, if you wanted to torture a person, you would tie their hands and their feet behind their back, the hands would be, and then you would slowly lower a boulder upon the person. You didn't drop it on them, you would slowly lower it on them. And eventually, it would push all the air out, and then it would begin to crush the internal organs, it would break the rib cage, and then you would die. But it was a slow, cruel death. That was what thalipsis meant. In fact, that's where we kind of get the uh, phrase between a rock and a hard place. That's thalipsis. Now, it evolved to mean any type of affliction you were going through, any type of suffering or hardship. But here John is, he's almost 90 years old, and he's writing this and he says, I'm your companion in tribulation. If you think you have it bad, I've got it just as bad. 
I am chained to this wheelbarrow. I'm almost 90 years old, and I'm forced to work in the mines. Now, according to Irenaeus, John was granted amnesty by the Emperor Nerva in A.D. 96, after the Roman Emperor Domitian died. And he was able to spend his last few years in the city of Ephesus. Now, tradition tells us that when he was in Ephesus, his health was so bad he couldn't hardly walk. And so what the people would do is they would literally carry him out in the streets on a pallet. And everyone would gather around and he would begin to tell stories of his early days with Jesus. And what it was like in the ministry. And he would tell all these different stories. And then he would preach a mini sermon. And he always ended this way. I beg you to love others as Christ also loved you. That was John. I mean, that was his life. Now, let's look at verse 10. John writes, I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day, and I heard behind me a great voice as of a trumpet. Now, what does John mean by, I was in the Spirit? Well, let me see if I can explain it to you. In the Old Testament, prophets would go into what is known as an open-eyed trance. The best way that I can explain this is to use the prophet Balaam as an example. How many of you remember the story of Balak and Balaam? Balaam was a prophet of God. Now, you need to remember the criteria for being a prophet. If you were a prophet, according to the Old Testament, you prophesied something. If it didn't come to pass, were you a prophet? No. What did Moses say was supposed to happen? You were supposed to be stoned. And so if you were a true prophet of God... Everything that you prophesied did not fall to the ground. In other words, it had power, it had life. It would come to pass. Now, what's interesting is the Bible says that Balaam was a prophet of God. So Balak is here and he's seeing the children of Israel come out of Egypt. He knows God is with them. He sees what they're doing to all of the nations around. And he says, boy, we're in trouble. So he calls upon Balaam and says, Balaam, I know you're a prophet of God. I've got all of these riches. If you will curse the children of Israel, I'll give these riches to you. And Balaam said, Balak, you don't understand. They're not my words. When I prophesy these things, I go into an open-eyed trance. I can only speak what the Lord puts in my mouth. You don't understand. He said, well, just come and try anyway. And, of course, we know the story and all the things that took place. And finally, he goes over there. But I want you to notice what the Scripture says because when he comes up to, quote, curse them, he goes into an open-eyed trance. And what does he do? He blesses the children of Israel. Now, notice what it says in Numbers 24, 4. He hath said, which heard the words of God, which saw the vision of the Almighty. So he's a prophet of God. Who's the Almighty? God. Falling into a trance, but having his eyes open. So he went into what is called an open-eyed trance. Now, we go a little bit further. Same chapter, verse number 16. We see this happen again. He hath said, which heard the words of God and knew the knowledge of the Most High, which saw the vision of the Almighty. Falling into a trance, but having his eyes open. So all Old Testament prophets, when they would prophesy the reason none of the words would fall to the ground, is because they go into an open-eyed trance. Now, one prophet took advantage of this, and God had to take him home. Who was that prophet? Elijah. Why did God have to take Elijah home? Because he's a prophet of God, and if anything that he prophesied didn't come to pass, then he wasn't a true prophet. And so God had to uphold the words of his mouth. And when the 50 come... And they said, we need to go to the king. And he says, if I be a man of God, let fire come down from heaven and destroy you. And they're destroyed. Now, is that the love of God? Mm Mm-mm. So another king's servant comes with 50 men, and they want to bring him in. And he says, if I be a man of God, let fire come down from heaven and destroy you. And it does. And God said, well, wait a minute. I'm going to have to take this boy home. (laughs) Why? Because if you're a true prophet, your words do not fall to the ground. They're going to come to pass. But the reason they would is because they went into an open-eyed trance. And they would be able to speak the words that God put in their mouth. Now we go a little bit further because this is what John is talking about when he says that he was in the Spirit. When he says he was in the Spirit on the day of the Lord, what he's talking about is I was in an open-eyed trance. Now we're going to see this a little bit further, but I want you to notice that's not just the Old Testament, that's also the New Testament. Peter and Paul also experienced these phenomenons. They referred to them as ecstasies in the Greek. They actually went into a trance and they would receive a vision. Look with me, if you would, in Acts chapter 10, verses 9 through 16. We're going to look at Peter first. 
The next day, as Cornelius' messengers were nearing the town, Peter went up on the flat roof to pray. It was about noon, and he was hungry. But while a meal was being prepared, he fell into a trance. Hmm. He saw the sky open, and something like a large sheet was, was let down by its four corners. In the sheet were all sorts of animals, reptiles, and birds. Then a voice said to him, Get up, Peter, kill and eat them. No, Lord, Peter declared. I have never eaten anything that our Jewish laws have declared to be impure and unclean. But the voice spoke again. Do not call something unclean if God has made it clean. The same vision. I want you to see. He went into a trance. He had a vision. Hmm. Now, the word trance is translated from the Greek word ecstasis. Does that sound familiar? It ought to. Our English word ecstasy actually comes from this Greek word. It's transliterated from it. Now, in English, ecstasy can mean one of two things. It can mean in intense joy or delight, or it can refer to being in a trance-like state. But in the Greek, in this context, the word ecstasis means to be in a trance, an open-eyed trance. And to see a vision. Now, let's look at Paul's experience. Because he has the very same experience that Peter does. Turn with me, if you would, to Acts chapter 22, verses 17 through 18. It says, After I returned to Jerusalem, I was praying in the temple, and I fell into a trance. Guess what Greek word that is? Ecstasis. Our English word ecstasy comes from it. It says, I saw a vision. So when John says that he was in the spirit, what he means is that he was in an open-eyed trance. That's when he received his revelation of Jesus. But I want you to notice what happened when he went into this open-eyed trance. Look back at verse number 10. I was in the spirit on the Lord's day. The Lord's day does not refer to Sunday as many of the commentators say. How many of you have a commentary on Revelation? Have you go home and looked this up? The majority of commentaries will say, on the Lord's Day refers to Sunday. But this verse has nothing to do with Sunday or any other day of the week for that matter. When John says that he was in the Spirit on the Lord's Day, what he means is that he was transported in time to what is known as the Day of the Lord. Now, how many of you know what the Day of the Lord is? Is that a familiar term? Well, let me explain it. Basically... The day of the Lord refers to the day of judgment. That God is intervening into this world and he is judging. Sometimes in the Old Testament you find out that God judged a nation and that's referred to as the day of the Lord. But basically and broadly when they say, it talks about the day of the Lord, it's talking about the end times. It's talking about this tribulation period. Why is it referring to the end times? Well, the reason it's referring to the end times is because the day of God's wrath and God's judgment is going to be poured out upon the world during this tribulation period. So in a broad sense, the day of the Lord refers to the end times. In a narrow sense, it refers to the second coming of Christ because when Christ comes and he comes on the Mount of Olives... The battle of Armageddon is getting ready to take place. And Jesus comes and he brings judgment with him. He wipes out all of those nations. And now there's going to be the great white throne judgment. So that is referred to as the day of the Lord in the narrow sense. Now John is using this term in the broad sense. He was in the spirit on the day of the Lord. In other words, he was taken by the spirit into the future to that period of time that is known as the end times. He gets to see a real, true documentary of what took place. And I should say it in that way. In the future, he sees what took place oh, in the past. He saw what took place in the future. He's able to see it all. He saw all of the events that are mentioned in the book of Revelation. He saw all of the events in the tribulation. He saw the battle of Armageddon. He saw the return of Jesus Christ. He saw the Messianic kingdom being established. So he is writing what he saw while he was in the spirit on the Lord's day. Now, I want you to put yourself in the place of John living in the first century. The fastest thing that you know of is a horse. The greatest weapons of war are the weapons of the Roman soldier. Now, if you've ever heard me teach 
on the spiritual armor, you realize that their armor was considered to be a weapon because it allowed them to march forward. We've looked at all of this, but that is your concept of warfare. You literally would march into the enemy and you had archers and you had lances and you had your armor on and you had your shields and you had your helmet and you had your sandals and your sandals had two inch metal spikes because when the enemy went down, you stepped on their neck and you immediately killed them. That was your concept of warfare. It's what you know. It's what you've seen. But then think of what it must have been like watching modern warfare. Watching 21st century warfare. Think of what it must have been like for John watching tanks shoot their cannons. Atomic bombs exploding. Helicopters and jets flying through the air. Now, imagine John seeing all of these things, and he has to write what he saw. He has to describe the events that are taking place. Well, that's the book of Revelation. And yes, some of it is symbolism, but some of it is just trying to describe 21st century events with a first century mentality, limited to a first century experience and vocabulary. Tough. But that was John. And he did a wonderful job in the spirit because he was in an open-eyed trance. And where the Old Testament prophet would only say what God put in their mouth, John would only write what the spirit would cause him to write. Now look at verse number 11. Saying, I am Alpha and Omega, the first and the last. And what thou seest, write in a book. And send it unto the seven churches which are in Asia, Unto Ephesus, and unto Smyrna, and unto Pergamos, and unto Thyatira, and unto Sardis, and unto Philadelphia, and unto Laodicea. Now, I want you to notice that John is commanded to write what he sees. He is not supposed to wait and then write what he saw. No, he's supposed to write as he's seeing the vision while he's in the Spirit. Now, I know many of you are asking, well, Pastor Allen, how do you know that? I know that because of the Greek grammar. You see, the word right is translated from the Greek word gropsen. Now, gropsen is not the root. Grapho is. So if you were to decline this, then you would come in and you would say it's from grapho, uh, grapho, grapho which means to write. But this is gropsen. It's in the aorist tense, which means that it's punctiliar action. And it's in the imperative mood, which means that it is a command. In other words, John was commanded to write and to do it now. In fact, 12 different times John is commanded to write and the same tense is used. The same mood is used. Why? Because in all probability, the natural tendency would be to simply watch in astonishment as this vision unfolds. Think about it. If you were in the spirit, transported in time, and you're literally seeing these events take place, it's not just a movie screen. It's like you are up in the sky and you're watching all of these things take place. Now, what would be your natural tendency? To get caught up in the story, to see all these things taking place. You're seeing the white horse come out. You see the red horse come. You see the atomic explosion. You see now the famine that takes place. You see the death that's happening. Then all of a sudden you see the first century martyrs that are stepping up and standing up for this. Then all of a sudden we begin to see all the other seals and the, all the other trumpets. Your natural tendency would be to just stop everything and to watch all this take place. So as we're going through the book of Revelation, God wants this vision to be recorded while he's in the spirit. So 12 different times John is commanded to Right, son, right. Once here and once in verse number 19. And then seven times in chapters 2 and 3. Each time he addresses a church, he's commanded to write. And three more times during the course of the book. Chapter 14, verse number 13. Chapter 19, verse number 9. And chapter 21, verse number 5. Now let's look at verse number 12. And I turned to see the voice that spake with me. And being turned, I saw... Seven golden candlesticks. Not a good translation. I'll tell you why in just a little bit. But I want you to notice that John turned to see the voice. Now people, you can't see a voice. 
So John wasn't trying to see a voice, that's just a figure of speech. He was trying to see who was speaking, because the voice was like a trumpet. It was this wonderful, powerful voice. But when he turned around, the first thing that he noticed was seven menorahs. You see this up on our chart. Here's the seven menorahs. But they're not just any menorahs. These are seven golden menorahs. These seven golden menorahs are symbolic. We're told in verse number 20 that they represent the seven churches. And that shouldn't surprise us. Why should that not surprise us? I'll tell you why. Because the purpose of a menorah is to give light. And that's also the function of the church. The churches are meant to be the light of the world. Remember what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 5, verse number 14 through 16? If you grew up in church, you heard this. Every pastor has taught the Sermon on the Mount and gone through the Beatitudes and looked at all the sayings of Jesus. I mean, that's just wonderful preaching material. But remember when Jesus said, you are the light of the world. A city on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before men, that they may see your good deeds and praise your Father in heaven. Now you see, the purpose of the church is to shine bright to the world, to show people the light of God's word, to show people what God is like. So when he turns and he sees these seven golden menorahs, they symbolize, and verse 20 tells us that, the seven churches. But what's interesting is we get into the second and third chapter, and he begins to address the churches. In chapter 2, verse number 5, Jesus said, If any church fails to shine forth with the light of God, and I'm kind of uh, expounding on this, adding a little bit here, it would be removed from the Lord's presence. Look in Revelation 2, 5. Look how far you have fallen. He's talking to the church of Ephesus. And what we're going to find out that the church of Ephesus represented the apostolic church. It was when the church was in its prime, just starting out. <clears throat> but it didn't take long towards the end of that period for them to begin to lose their first love. To begin to get to the point where now they were going through the actions and it really wasn't in their heart. Now come on, you know what I'm talking about. You go to church. You pray, you read your Bible. But the word is not becoming alive in your heart. It's not like it was when you first got saved and everyone thought you were crazy because you couldn't help but tell people about Jesus. And so what does God tell him? He says, you need to repent. You need to turn back to me and do the works you did at first. If you don't repent, if your light doesn't shine, I will come and I will remove your lampstand from its place among the churches. Now you need to understand something. We are the church. So he's talking to individuals. That's why in verse number 3, chapter 1, he said, Blessed is a person, not just who reads it, not just who hears it, but the one who heeds all the things that are written therein. When we get to these messages to the church, you need to understand the messages are to you. Because you are the church. How does it apply to you? Now, the reason there are seven menorahs is because this number seven denotes perfection or completion. I'm doing all right. I looked at my watch. We're fine. <laughs> These seven churches represent all churches, the complete church. The reason there are seven is because it is the complete church of God. Jesus, and we're going to find this, he's going to be in the middle of these seven menorahs. He's in the middle of the churches. They're, not, they're illuminating Jesus. Now, what's the message that we have here? What are we supposed to be doing in this world? Illuminating Jesus. People need to know who Jesus is. How many of you on Wednesdays get the, the, the uh, Telequa Daily Press? Do you ever read the church page? I always read the Unitarian Church. You need to do that. They talk about Jesus today. Mm. My heart goes out for them. They don't understand who Jesus is. But the church is doing an awful poor job of reflecting and, and illuminating Jesus to the world. And that's very sad. Let's look at verse number 13. In the midst of the seven candlesticks, one likened to the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to the foot, 
and gird about the paps with a golden girdle. Now, some of you are probably wondering why I'm reading the King James Version. Because when you perform exegesis, you go to the original Greek, but because of all the reference materials, it's kind of the standard thing to do. But I do bring out the NLT and the other verses to help you, but only after we look at what the original language says, all right? Because we don't say paps, gird about the paps with a golden girdle, do we? Anyone even know what a pap is? Well, it's interesting. The word mastectomy comes from the Greek word that this is, comes from, but it means chest. So, gird about the chest. Now, notice what it says. In the middle of these seven menorahs, John saw one likened to the Son of Man. Son of Man is a title that Jesus gave himself when he walked upon this earth. Look at Matthew chapter 18, verse number 11. For the Son of Man is come to save that which was lost. Jesus is referring to himself. He's calling himself the Son of Man. Now, why in the world did Jesus refer to himself as the Son of Man? Well, he did it in order to make people stop and think. You see, the Jews used the word son in two different ways. They used it literally and they used it figuratively. When they used it literally, it denoted the male offspring of a person. Let me give you an example. I am George Nolan's son. I'm the male offspring of of my dad. I'm his son. So we use that in a literal way just like they did. But they also used it figuratively. It was used as a figure of speech. Now when it was used of, in a figure, as a figure of speech, the way you did it was if a person had a peculiar quality, you would call that person the son of that quality. A good example is the term son of Belial. How many of you have ever been reading through the Old Testament and you come to this phrase son of Belial? And you're thinking, man, this man Belial gets around. He's got a lot of sons running around. Uh, Belial is not a real person. Belial means wicked or worthless. All right? So when you're reading along in the Old Testament and you see a person that's wicked, someone who is worthless... You would refer to them as a son of Belial because when the word son is used figuratively, it means that that person has a peculiar quality and you refer to him as a son of that peculiar quality. Does that make sense? Let me give you a real life example. Look in Judges chapter 19 verse 22. Now, as they were making their hearts merry, behold, the men of the city, certain sons of Belial. Now, what does that mean? Well, every Hebrew, every Jew knew what that meant. It meant these men were wicked and worthless. They had the quality or the characteristics of wicked people, of worthless people. So they were referred to as the son of Belial. Now, let's take this and apply this to Jesus. Why would Jesus refer to himself as the son of man? Well, the reason he referred to himself as the son of man is because he was calling attention to the fact that he had the qualities of a man. He had the characteristics of a man. But by doing that, he was implying that he was much more than just a man. Think about this. If I started referring to myself as the son of man, you would go, well, if you knew the figure of speech, you would go, well, yeah, you are a man. You've got all the qualities. You've got all the characteristics. He's crazy. But you see, all of these people were walking with Jesus. And they were seeing Jesus do things that men don't do. Jesus was raising the dead. Jesus was healing people of all types of infirmities. He was healing the blind. He was healing the lame. People had leprosy. Fingers were falling off. And when he healed them, they had new fingers. They had all of these extremities to them. Jesus was performing miracles. He was walking on water and he was turning water into wine. And so when Jesus says, I'm the son of man, you go, whoa, what are you talking about? You've got the qualities and the characteristics of man, but you're no man. Jesus was implying, I'm more than a man. I'm God. Now, in verse number 13... John says he was like the Son of Man. In other words, when he sees this person who's standing in the midst of the seven menorahs, he says, I know that man. That man is Jesus, the one who walked on the earth, the Son of Man. But now he's in heaven. And boy, he's not the same. 
He's different than when he walked the earth. Why is he different? Because now he's in his glorified body. He's now the way he was before he emptied himself of his deity and came in the form of a man. This is the kenosis doctrine. But you find it in Philippians chapter 2, verses 6 through 7. This is where Jesus emptied himself. This is kind of interesting. Jesus was God, but he emptied himself of the deity. And when he walked as a man, he walked under the power of the Holy Spirit. So everything that he did was under the power of the Holy Spirit. But he operated in every gift. He had the gift of word of knowledge. He had the gift of word of wisdom. He had the gifts of healings. I mean, this person was, was not lacking in any way. He wasn't using his deity. He was allowing the Holy Spirit to work through him. But now when Jesus sees him, and he knows it's Jesus, or when John sees Jesus, he knows it's Jesus, but he's different. He's not the same as he was when he walked on this earth. Now he is the way he was before he emptied himself. And that's Philippians 2, 6-7. Though he was God, he did not think, it, think of equality with God as something to cling to. Instead, he gave up his divine privileges. He took the humble position of a slave. And he was born as a human being when he appeared in human form. Now, I want you to notice how he's clothed. When he turns and he sees Jesus, who's in the midst of the seven candlesticks... He's clothed kind of funny. But if you're familiar with the Old Testament, if you've studied it any bit at all, immediately you know how he's clothed. He's clothed just like the Old Testament high priest. Why would he be clothed as the high priest? Well, he's clothed as the high priest because now that he's in heaven, he's performing his ministry of intercession. He's actually performing his ministry as the high priest. Now, this is really cool. I don't have much time, but I'm going to go into this. It's okay, right? Yeah. Everything that Jesus did, he had to do it legally. Why? Because God is a just God. God does things by the rules. He does things by his own rules. God legally raised Jesus from the dead. Had Jesus ever sinned, God would not have been able to have raised him from the dead. But Leviticus, the 18th chapter, verse number 5 says, The man which doeth these things, talking about the law, shall live by them. Because Jesus fulfilled the law in its entirety, even by becoming sin for you, because he loved his neighbor as himself and he loved God. The two greatest commandments in which all the law hangs upon are those two commandments that you love God with all your heart, your soul, and your mind. And you love your neighbor as yourself, right? So God asked him, to lay down his life. So he loves God and he obeys God. But not only that, because he loves you, there's no greater love than a man lays down his life. So he literally allows himself to become your sin. And he dies for us. But when all our sin is paid for, God looks down into hell and he sees a soul that's never sinned. And according to his word, Leviticus 18.5, the man which doeth these things, who does the law, shall live by them. So God looks down into hell and he says, live, and Jesus comes alive. Now, you need to understand something about God. He will only do what is legal, what is right. And so, when Jesus gets ready to perform the duties of the high priest, he cannot go into heaven because he's not the high priest and offer himself until he becomes like Melchizedek. But we have a high priest on, on earth. But that high priest forfeited his right to be the high priest. Because if you remember when Aaron's son sinned and they offered up the strange incense, they died. And Moses goes to Aaron and he says, do not rip your clothing. You don't understand. This is representative of the high priest in heaven. He says, you cannot come. You cannot defile yourself. So Aaron has to stay there. Cannot rip his clothes. But if you remember when Jesus comes along and he asks him if he is the son of God and he starts telling these things, what does the high priest do? He rips his clothes. He forfeits his right to be the high priest. Jesus steps in and becomes the high priest. Now he's able to offer himself, dies for our sins, goes up into heaven, and now he is the high priest forevermore. Now, just a little bit in there. Thought you might like that. So now he's, he is performing his ministry as the high priest. Look in Hebrews chapter 7, verses 24 through 26, and we are not going to make it. But we're going to finish this part. But because Jesus lives forever, his priesthood lasts forever. Therefore, he is able once and forever to save those who come to God through him. He lives forever to intercede with God on their behalf. 
He is the kind of high priest we need because he is holy and blameless, unstained by sin. He has been set apart from sinners and has been given the highest place of honor in heaven. Now, as our high priest, notice what he does. Turn with me, if you would, to 1 John chapter 2, verse number 1. Sin, mm, the thing we hate. My dear children, I am writing this to you so that you will not sin. But if anyone does sin, and we do every day, we have an advocate who pleads our case before the Father. He is Jesus Christ, the one who is truly righteous. Now, I want you to notice, he's an advocate. He's a lawyer. God does things legally, right? All right? So he's an advocate, and he pleads our case, just like a lawyer does. But he pleads our case, but not in the way that we think of a lawyer doing it. He doesn't point to our works and say, well, you know, God, I know Alan didn't really mean it. He's really trying really hard. You need to forgive him. Because that doesn't work with God, because God is just. Yes, God is merciful, but God is perfect in all of his character. So he cannot sacrifice his justice just because he's merciful. Sin must be punished. So it wouldn't do any good for Jesus to say, well, you know, I, I know Alan didn't really mean to do it. Give him a break, God. No, he's not pleading his case that way. Because my works are as filthy rags. So what does he do? He points to his work. So when we goof up, we have this advocate who pleads our case. Now, go to Hebrews chapter 7, verse 22, and we have an idea of how he pleads it. By so much was Jesus made a surety of a better testament or better covenant. I want you to underline that word surety. How many of you know what surety is? Surety is the Greek word inguos. Inguos is the Greek word for cosigner. How many of you ever cosigned and got stuck? You never cosign again. Should have read the book of Proverbs. All right? What is a cosigner? Well, it's someone who accepts responsibility for someone else's debt when they default on their obligation. So when we do not fulfill our covenant obligations, Jesus steps in and he says, that's all right, God. I know Alan's sin, but I paid for that sin. And the devil goes, I can't believe that. But that's Jesus. He's our high priest. Did I get you? Sorry. Didn't mean to do that. What a wonderful high priest. But that is the reason why he's dressed the way he is. And that's where we'll stop. We'll get 14 and 15 next week. Now, I'm here to tell you, if you thought that you could get to heaven based on your good works, I'm here to tell you that your works are as filthy rags. And you don't want to know what that really means in the original language. All right? But the great thing is, we had a person who was willing to come and covenant with us, to bind together with us, to be made our sin that we might be made the righteousness of God. So if you're here tonight and you're banking on getting to go to heaven because you're a member of a church or you've been baptized or you're doing the best you can, I'm here to tell you that will not get you to heaven. The only way you can get to heaven is by receiving Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior. You need a revelation of who Jesus is. And Jesus is our Savior. I get to go to heaven not because I'm a pastor, because I'm serving him. I get to go to heaven because Jesus paid the price of my sin. And when I stand before God, it says paid for. Paid in full by Jesus Christ. Life Principles is dedicated to helping you not only learn about God, but successfully apply biblical principles to your everyday life. For information about other teaching series by Pastor Allen, visit our website at cornerstonefellowship.tv.